there are some things that we really do not want to hear. But these are often the very things we need to hear. It might be a warning for students from a school advisor. You're skipping classes. You don't get your assignments in. You are failing tests. You are about to flunk out. It might be advice from a financial advisor. They might point out you're spending money like a teenager. If you keep this up, you may go broke and end up in poverty in your old age. It might be a warning from your doctor. You are overweight. You never exercise. Your cholesterol is too high. Your blood pressure is too high. You are at high risk for a stroke or a heart attack. It could be a word from a spouse. You're never home. You become a stranger to your own kids. We never talk anymore. Like it or not, you may have to talk to my lawyer. All of these are examples of tough love. We may not want to hear the message, but if we do not listen, we will certainly lose out. Now the Bible is absolutely full of challenging messages and examples of tough love. The Word of God is divine revelation. It reveals to us what God wants us to know. It is a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. Now we may prefer to only hear those passages that comfort us and console us. But the Holy Scriptures teach us the full, unvarnished truth. They teach us what is right and they expose what is wrong. They correct what is deficient in our lives so that we can be recreated in grace, born again into an entirely new way of living. And the Word of God is amazing. The Word of God can work miracles. The Word of God can always accomplish what God intends if, if, if we accept its authority. Today's Gospel reading, according to Mark, we certainly hear profoundly challenging words from the very lips of our Savior. Jesus and his disciples are traveling from Caesarea Philippi through Galilee on their way to Capernaum. Jesus uses this journey as an opportunity to teach the inner circle of his disciples about his destiny as their Messiah to be betrayed and handed over to the pagans. He tells his closest friends that he would be crucified, but then after three days in the tomb would rise from the dead. This is one of six times in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus clearly predicts both his death and his rising. This strong emphasis on the cross is quite deliberate. This is actually the core message of the entire Gospel of Mark, that Jesus cannot really be understood apart from his destiny to die on the cross. In the Gospel of Mark, the cross, more than any other event, interprets both the life and the rising of Jesus just as it authoritatively defines discipleship. So in today's Gospel, Jesus uses the prediction of his passion and death as an opportunity to teach those who are closest to him about the nature of discipleship, about what it means to follow Jesus, and 
also about how leadership should be exercised within the family of believers. The concluding instruction only takes place when they finally arrive at Peter's house in Capernaum. The evangelists have already recorded the fact that the disciples had not understood what Jesus had meant in his earlier prediction about death and betrayal. The disciples basically saw Jesus as a kind of worldly messiah, rather like the glamorous King David. They hoped Jesus would finally defeat the Romans in battle and then establish a new kingdom in Judah, with all of them, of course, appointed as princes, the prominent leaders of a new political order. Actually, the gospel seems to indicate that the disciples did not want to hear and were afraid to really understand what Jesus might really be saying. So the Lord pointedly asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? In fact, what they were arguing about was which of them would be the greatest, the most important, the most powerful in the kingdom that Jesus was to establish. Jesus had already really begun his way of the cross, his journey up to Jerusalem to suffer and die, not just for the freedom of one nation, but for the freedom of the entire world. But even his closest disciples were still preoccupied only with their selfish, petty way of personal ambition and self-promotion. So Jesus sits down in their midst and calls the twelve to gather around him. And in that authoritative, seated position, it was the gesture of a rabbi about to deliver an essential teaching to his disciples who would customarily stand around him. Jesus delivers a very strong message about the nature of leadership in the kingdom of God. He says, Whoever wants to be first among you must be the servant of all. And then, as an example, he calls a little child to him and places that powerless youngster in the very center of their circle. He embraces the child and teaches whoever welcomes even one such as this child in my name welcomes me and whoever welcomes me welcomes God the Father who sent me. This is the great circle of grace that God so freely shares with us and that we are called then to freely share with one another. The way of Jesus is all about love and mercy, about generous service to our neighbor, and not about some personal power trip. The correcting message of today's appointed scriptures is that pride and personal ambition should never preoccupy those who travel along the way with Jesus. The Lord came to serve, not to be served all those who hear his word and try to follow him must also be givers and servers in this world. Jesus served us so that we would serve one another. Jesus forgave us so that we would be forgiving. Jesus died for our sake so that we could live forever and ever. This way of Jesus is a life worth living. This is a way of life filled with meaning, filled with peace, filled with blessing, filled with love. The gospel is not only good news, the word of God is the whole truth, everything we need to live in time and travel to eternity. Now at every Mass, the death of the Lord is proclaimed 
until he comes again in glory. His one perfect sacrifice on the cross is renewed, made present for us, so that we too might share in the awesome power of his resurrection. So at this Mass, at this Oktoberfest, on this beautiful Sunday morning, German Americans and non-German Americans alike, may we all truly hear Jesus and listen to his corrections and warnings. Let us put our faith in his words and then put his words into practice in the way we try to live our lives. And at this Mass, in our Holy Communion, we too can truly be embraced by Christ, held and comforted in the arms of the Lord, just like that little child was 20 long centuries ago. At this Mass, secure in the gift of God's love, may all of us be born again as children of God, God's own little ones. Jesus once promised, if anyone opens, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. What an amazing gift. What an incomparable blessing. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the teaching, correcting, consoling, life-giving words of Jesus Christ will never pass away.